very special interview edition for the Irish Wrestling Podcast on behalf of Bodyslam.net. My name is Mark O'Brien, and I'm joined by somebody I'm a huge fan of. Maybe many of here in Ireland may not be as familiar with. El Rudo de las Chicas, Sam Adonis. Sam, how are you? Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I am, I am just wonderful. I appreciate the invitation. I'm here in Dallas, Texas. It is a Wednesday right now, and uh, we're just getting ready to, to roll into the weekend. And I, I moved to Dallas because I travel so much here in the United States. And for, for your fans that do not know who I am, I always try to explain to myself, I'm the busiest wrestler you've never heard of. Uh, I've been you know, very busy and fortunate for the last 15 years to work all over the world and have a good reputation and have uh, connections within the industry to keep a full schedule. But I've never really kind of gone the the internet wrestling route. I've never tried to you know go and and work in the certain companies where you have to take less money or you, you have to you know kill yourself to get noticed. I've really done it in my own way, and I'm very proud of that. A very traditional way, I would say, the, the way you kind of, you're a traditional traveling wrestler, a very much an independent wrestler. You, you talked about recently in an interview I saw that you said that you'd never signed a contract in 15 years. I, I find that quite like just on a high level. I find that really hard to believe, given how successful you've been with CMLL, AAA, you've been with MLW briefly. You had an independent, or you had a short stint with FCW, um, or as WWE developmental. How have you managed to kind of maintain that autonomy and independence throughout that? So the the WWE, obviously, that was a contract. That was my my main contract that I sold. But since then, uh, you know, there, there's almost two trains of thought. You could either look at it as, oh, that guy sucks. Nobody wants to sign him to a contract. Or you could say, oh, my gosh, that guy has had a, a hell of a career. Mm-hmm. And to to give him that responsibility and to put him in those positions and trust him enough to, to not hold up a promoter and, and to not, you know, miss out or, or you know, kind of misrepresent a situation I think that that's how I like to look at it. And I think that speaks volumes from what I've done. You know, CMLL and AAA have, have a brutal history and they hate each other for years. And it's one of those things where, you know, I was working on a handshake agreement for both of them. There's nothing stopping me right now from jumping to the other one, other than the fact that, you know, I, I have a little bit of decency to me. But uh, it, it's one of those things where I, I've always been a big fan growing up uh, around the wrestling business with my dad being a promoter, my brother being a wrestler. I've always admired the the classic style, the journeyman style. Terry Funk is my absolute idol. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't even, I don't even think there's a close number two best wrestler of all time. I think Terry is pretty much you know a runaway with that. Uh, guys like him and Bruiser Brody, Abdul the Butcher, where they'd be able to make a living, make a name, and travel in the world. And I, I also kind of consider myself one of the only real heels left in wrestling. You know, I, I come to town and and I make you like a guy that you normally wouldn't like. Mm-hmm. And you know, to be a traveling heel in 2024 is almost unheard of. And people people think being a heel is just you know screaming at the fans, shut up, and you know being the mean guy in the match. And, and it's a lot more than that. So to actually stay relevant and, and be flown across the world and and represented as the bad guy, um, I take a lot of pride in that. Well, I, I, I we touched off before we started this recording. I saw you a couple of years ago at WrestleCon in Dallas ahead of WrestleMania 38. And it became very evident that you were having the time of your life in terms of like everything you're doing was with a wink and a nod. I found it very unique. I'd never been in a kind of an audience where it was obviously a Mexican driven audience where they're very invested in what's actually happening. Oh, mi amor, bandido, bandido. And then you've got then yourself and Jeff Jarrett come out. You've spent time in the UK. So you understand what Panto is in this part of the world in terms of really like kind of over the top villainy heel, but doing it and having the time of your life. Like you, I think you'd be walking up the, the, the ramp afterwards, I could distinctly remember, and you're almost laughing. You're like, how much right. fun you were having at the time. You, you, you well, said, sorry, go on. A, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I, I would say more so than my time in FCW, I really cut my teeth in the UK, working for Brian Dixon yeah. uh, for All-Star Wrestling. And, you know, if you're going to mention Panto, literally All-Star Wrestling was the alternative to the Panto at the holiday camps. Yeah. You know, I, I was doing 150 shows a year at Butlins and Haven all over the country. And it's literally, you know, at three o'clock panto, five o'clock karaoke, seven o'clock wrestling, you know, and we're right there in that same vein. So, you know, All Star almost taught me how to appeal to a non wrestling fan, how to entertain, you know, the, the masses, if you will. Um, and that has really been the secret to my success across the world. Uh, I think a lot of young wrestlers assume, you know, you get caught up in, in, in what's happening on your social media or on, uh, you know, what you're seeing on TV. And a lot of people 
lose sight of the fact that, you know, we're a very small niche, no matter where we are, especially on the independents. You know, to, to think that anybody in the audience actually cares about any of us is, is kind of a stretch. Um, if you can figure out a way to entertain everybody and, and just keep moving forward and not having to worry about the opinions of the fans, you know, eventually you'll find you'll turn around and you'll have a whole legion of fans. Yeah, almost being authentic to yourself and just knowing that what you're doing is a role to a degree. I like you, you, when you kind of debuted in Mexico, I think it was back in 2016, you, you, were, you first started out in CMLL. And you were portraying this over the top pro Trump gimmick. And like again, that time, that that time, same year where there's an election cycle going. I was living in America at the time and it was kind of a bit hard to believe what was going on at the time. But you came out with the Rick Rude airbrush Donald Trump tights and gear, and then you had the, the flag with Donald Trump's face, and then you'd you'd come out and said you're the most hated man in America or Mexico at the time. How would like I mean on top of like having fun while you're doing it, but it's probably an element of danger on top of that, then like having to travel back, say you're in Dallas or Pittsburgh at the time, wherever you were. <laughs> So uh, while it was going on, I, I think I was a little bit naive to, to what kind of danger I actually could have put myself in. Um, generally, you know, the world is much more good than bad. Yeah. And if you tend to, you know, if you don't poke your nose where it doesn't belong, you tend to stay away from some trouble. So, you know, Mexico is a great country. Some of my best friends are there. It's just an unbelievable place. And, you know, in my experience, living two years there, you know, it's not nearly as dangerous as the rest of the world has been told it is. Uh, that being said, you know, sometimes I might be in the dangerous part of town, uh, you know, around the dangerous people doing a Lucha show because that's kind of the, the the market that Lucha appeals to. And I might, you know, not exactly be in shouting distance, you know, and, and I'm really pushing things to the limit. Mm. So I, 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 I was luckily able to learn Spanish while I was there. And as soon as the match is over... I always made sure I get pictures with the fans and make sure they know that like, you know, I don't come out and say, Hey, that's all bullshit. I'm just a bad guy, you know, but I, I do want to make sure they know that I'm respectful. I'm speaking their language. Um, even, even the big news media sites like CNN, Vice, Reuters, all these places that followed me and asked about that gimmick. They all tried to paint the pictures. Are you, yeah. are you race baiting? Are you, you know, is this, Oh, and I'm like, guys, it's wrestling. You know, that's this, yeah. if anything, I'm, I'm making people laugh about a serious issue. You know, they turn your TV on, you turn on the news or whatever media channel they have on and, and they're stressed and angry and worried about the election. At least when you turn on wrestling, you get to laugh about it for 30 minutes. Like you're absolutely just succeeding what you're doing in your role more than anything. You kind of pivoted that then you got a really cool opportunity. You were um, a lot of fans might know this when you, you made an appearance over All Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, and obviously you'd had some interactions with Ultimo Dragon over in CMLL and AAA and whatnot prior to that. And you'd taken his mask off in... Mexico, but you also have the distinction of take, being the only person in the world to take his mask off, rip it off, both in Mexico and Japan. So as somebody who is kind of, you were launched off, kind of off the back of that gimmick in terms of your awareness kind of globally, what was what was that like to have that additional kudos and be able that kind of accolade to your collection? So the, the craziest thing about working with Ultimo Dragon is he was unequivocally my number one favorite wrestler as a child. Like, I mean, it's, it's almost kind of bizarre and, and eerie to think about you know because in by 1996 97 you know my, my dad was a promoter we had all the old videos we had the toys and the magazines so i wasn't your average 6 year old kid watching wrestling on tv you know wanting the good guy to win and the bad guy to win i was obsessed with this i was watching videos 24 7 i was playing with the toys i was reading the magazines everything about wrestling i had to know so yeah. when ultimo dragon came to wcw i was like oh my god what is this this is my favorite wrestler and, you know, for years, it even got to the point where I was 15. I went to an independent show and I bought his mask. I, I, I got it signed. And it was like my, you know, holy grail of my wrestling collection was my Ultimate Dragon mask because he meant that much to me. Now, you know, I mean, he literally invites me to his house to cook steaks. You know, it's, it's, he takes me to, to dinners in Mexico City and Tokyo. It was absolutely incredible. Um, but more than anything, I think it's, I take pride in it. You know, it's one of those things where anybody that knows him knows he's a very elegant man. He, he holds himself to an absurdly high standard. He doesn't take BS from anybody. He's not going to give people a discount. He doesn't need the money. You know, he's Ultimo Dragon. Mm -hmm. If you want him on your show or you want to be around him, you're going to pay the price to have it. You know, and to think that for ba for the better part of the last five years, you know, I, I, I you could arguably say that I've been his rival for the last five years. 
And anytime he's had his major productions, you know, he's wanted Sam Adonis to wrestle against. You know, I think it goes back to being the last, you know, uh, of a traveling heel. Mm. You know, a guy like Ultimo Dragon gets over everywhere. But when you have a, a traveling heel or somebody that knows how to, to accentuate that and make it better, now Ultimo Dragon has to do half as much work to get twice as much recognition. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, when, when you're one of these veterans and you know that much about this stuff and, uh, you know, uh, he knows what he's doing. And it's definitely meant the world to me. That's really cool. You see so many different other wrestlers kind of the modern day who kind of are wrestling in major promotions around the world and suddenly they're becoming best friends and they're uh, with their child. I, I saw Dax Harwood today, just as a similar example, he put up a, a video today of Bret Hart being flown down somehow for his 40th birthday, wherever he was in the world. But like that's, re- that's a really cool tidbit. Like you're having that relationship from, with Ultimo Dragon from your childhood to now. That's awesome. Um, and it's it's, de- it's definitely surreal. And, and you know, the fact that I've wanted to go to Japan. Japan was always probably more of a priority to mine of mine than Mexico was. And the problem with Japan is now, you know, there's just as many companies there as there is here and all of them have wrestling schools and a lot of, you know, there's kind of a culture that's born among ignorance here in the United States that, you know, training in Japan is the same as working in Japan. You know, a lot of people want to go train in Japan and they think that, you know, that's kind of the same as, as getting booked in Japan. So I had opportunities when I was younger to, get, to go train in Japan, and I just couldn't couldn't bring myself to do it. I said, no, I, I like Terry Funk and Bruiser Brody. I want to do it that way. <laughs> uh, it might take a little longer, but, you know, these guys are going to carry my bags from the airport. You know, and it took 10 years to get there. You know, it was my 10th year wrestling, but I was invited to All Japan by Ultimo Dragon. My debut was in the you know main event of Cork and Hall against Ultimo Dragon. I took his mask off, you know. It, it, it's sometimes i think it's not just wrestling it's it's life in general now everybody's in such a damn hurry for mm-hmm. everything yeah. nobody lets anything marinate and i think the beauty of wrestling is the the process the the time it takes the marinating um and i think you know in, in my particular position i think some things have taken a lot longer but i think i i almost end up with better rewards because so few people are that willing and that patient to put in the extra extra work yeah i think that this kind of reflects on you're saying in the modern world like sometimes the, lo- the road less traveled is, is more fulfilling and like a lot of things that are difficult or really cool when you kind of get to a, a goal end point you've had to go through a long struggle or road to get to that point as well but like you, you have reached a level say in you're talking about being a hated man in mexico you're still one of the most hated men in mexico like you're I, you're recently on your leading the charge of this trip mania a summer series the moment like i was watching your matches recently with your one in april with the, the guys over in, in tijuana representing team usa then your matches over in june again with team usa how what's that been like you're kind of the focal point like the lead rudo as, as it would be for the main promotion over in, in mexico as such yeah i i definitely take pride in it um mm-hmm. i think in general american fans and the rest of the world for that matter they they kind of hold japan on a pedestal yeah. Um, you know, Japanese wrestling is a totally different than, than Mexican. Japan is very detail oriented and people want to focus and understand and, 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 you know, really understand what they're watching. Whereas Mexico, it's all from the heart. It's all passion. It's good and bad. And you don't really have to care what's happened, which is funny because they are very intricate in what they do. But in Mexico, uh, you know, it, I feel like a lot of people don't really understand the lucha they're watching. I think people have a preconceived notion that Lucha Libre is what WCW told them Lucha Libre was. They think that it's high flying mask guys. Mm -hmm. And if you watch Lucha Libre, you know, triple A right now, it's not all high flying mask guys. You know, it might be about 30% high flying mask guys, but you know, I I think people kind of hold that against Mexico because they hold their own ignorance against the presentation, you know? And I think, you have to go into AAA knowing you have to have an open mind. And the best way to look at it would be like, okay, this is Royal Rumble and Survivor Series plus Ringling Brothers yeah. on pay-per-view. Yeah. That's what you're watching. And you have to break the mindset that you're comparing this to, to mm-hmm. you know, AEW tonight or to what WWE did on pay-per-view Saturday. You have to really understand that this is different. And I think a lot of times it's unfair that people just kind of critique and say, oh, that wasn't, oh, that was sloppy or that was, it's almost, there's so much more to it that people need to understand. And right now, after eight years, I'm finally in the position to to be the guy to know how to pull those strings. 
so, you know, being with guys from AEW, Jeff Jarrett, Satnam Singh, uh, QT Marshall, and Parker Bordeaux, yeah. it's been my responsibility to kind of, you know, help them uh, uh, figure out the lay of the land. Uh, and it's not to say that they couldn't do it without me. You know, they're they're excellent, excellent performers. But, you know, now it's kind of I've reached the point where, you know, that's I, I don't think anybody would challenge me on that. You know, I've been there long enough. I think it, it just makes the most sense. Well, oh, shit. Sam knows what he's talking about. And luckily, it's been successful that far. Yeah, I mean, even the guys you're team with, them, you can list them off there. Jeff Jarrett is part of that crew, but he's largely on the, on the sidelines being a manager and whatnot. You're, you're team with guys who are technically signed to companies or were signed to companies, but aren't featured that much on television. Like QT Marshall, for example, he's got a huge amount of experience as a wrestler, but not necessarily a huge amount of experience on television when he was with AEW as a performer. Satnam Singh, you've now turned into an American citizen down in Mexico, seemingly. Um, so, hey. But then Parker Boudreaux has been going to jump from company to company. How has that been? You're kind of, you're the, the ringleader. You're the... You're the chaperone almost. These guys are entirely new to this entire this huge new genre of wrestling down in Mexico, and you've got to bring them through this process and kind of at the same time make sure you guys are the most over people on the card. Well, it's one of those. It's almost one of those thankless situations because you know again we're just one match on the show, and you know it's a show of eight or nine matches, and all I, I you know we all put the work in, and, and Jeff is just a fountain of knowledge. QT is incredible. There's literally nothing he can't do. And we've been able to kind of, you know, put the perfect formula together. But it's almost one of those things where if all you want to do is not give them the satisfaction of anything going wrong. And if everything goes status quo the way it's supposed to, nobody thinks twice. Like, okay, cool. Good job, guys. There's no more story. Nobody knows how difficult it was just to get to that point. You know what I mean? And it's it feels kind of cool in a way because, you know, I, I I know that, you know, I was an architect of a lot of it. And to know that, you know, it went well, but it also there's no real, you know, there's really no gratification for it. I know it. You know, Jeff Jarrett knows it. But other than that, you know, the fans don't know it. The bookers don't know it. The, the other wrestlers don't know it. It's just it is what it is. But I, I think more than anything, I'm proud of the fact that. I've literally learned Lucha. I'm not just a, you know, an American guy. I'm not just, okay, Hey, go work in Mexico. You know, I, I've literally learned their style and their language. And now I think, uh, I can adapt anybody to the Mexican style as well as the American style. Yeah. I mean, like self-fulfillment is, is gratifying as anything. If, if anything more, I think if I'm being self-fulfillment and, and piecing yourself is more gratifying than external validation and a lot of the time as well so that's that's really really cool like obviously you, you're, again the triple mania series in the minute you've obviously gone you've done your monterey show you've done your tijuana show and then you've got your kind of your set piece show you've got mexico city at the end of the summer what can we expect from i don't know from yourself or team usa what's on the horizon for you guys or for you honestly i i wish i had some spoilers for you but i don't have any <laughs> i don't know um triple a is is uh, again it's the it's the wild wild west and i think that's why a lot of people like working down there yeah. um it's it really is as close to 1979 you know memphis wrestling that you're gonna find anywhere on earth yeah. good guy bad guy blood and violence you know that that kind of stuff's still there but a lot of stuff is kind of just uh, the mexican culture is a little different a little bit slower moving um they might not prioritize information as much as we do so you know I go along to get along. I know I have my spot and I, you know, I, I don't question it. I don't rock the boat. Um, I sometimes think that uh, other people might be frustrated. You know, it, I don't know if, if I would be able to be where I am right now if I didn't know the way the Mexican culture works, because I, you know, I've developed the patience over certain things and it's just the way it is. And it's, it's one of the, sometimes it's, you can't explain anything more than that's just how it is in Mexico. That could, that is, you know, there's nothing more than that, but I've been around long enough to know that sometimes that could be, you know, a little bit more stressful to other performers that aren't willing to take that as a justification. Yeah. Like, listen, if the August show is anywhere as near as entertaining as last year's August show um, and your beautiful blonde hair suddenly goes disappearing, missing again, we're in for a big ride. So for fans who don't know, poor Sam got his head shaved in a match in a fatal four way match was a bit of a, a strange uh, situation. Um, but yeah, listen, it's your set piece event. I'll, I'll definitely be tuning in from this part of the world. You've also had some amazing kind of opportunities recently as well. You're fighting at the Crockett cup. You were face EC3 for the NWA world's heavyweight title. That's really indicative of the kind of the traveling champion, the traveling wrestler. How, how cool was that to be in that position, be brought in for that show in that big spot? 
Uh, that was actually really, really cool because I've worked for a, uh, NW in the past. You know, there was a point where when I was living in Pittsburgh, I was able to do a couple of their TV tapings. And, you know, NWA was a lot of the guys that were signed to FCW at the same time as I. So I went in there. I knew everybody. I wasn't quite the veteran, but I wasn't. There was definitely not the green kid, but it was just a stacked locker room. And there was, you know, it was post-COVID. There's all kinds of, you know, disarray about what was happening. Mm. So. Billy Corgan and I came to terms with the fact that, you know, there really wasn't a reason for me to be there. Right. Now. You know, it was no hard feelings. You know, sometimes you're better off walking away and just figuring out something better, you know, and give them a reason to bring you back. And it took almost two years, but I gave them a reason to come back, you know, and, and it came, they came here to Dallas where I live now. And, you know, I was in the, the heavyweight title match with EC3 in a, a packed house. And it was a totally different experience. You know, they, 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 treated me almost as, as a whole new wrestler. I wasn't just, you know, one of the guys. So um, it was awesome. It, it feels nice. Um, I think the beauty of getting older is you, you get wiser and you understand. And, and I've been in just as much as a hurry as anybody to get to the top. But now, you know, there's almost certain points of, of you know, certain markers along the way that you appreciate that it didn't happen too fast. You know, you really can sit back and, and smell the coffee and understand that like, it's nice that it takes a while because uh, you know, I, I, my, my favorite quote is, you know, anybody can get clout, but very few people can get respect. Mm. And I think in modern, modern days wrestling, you know, that's a thing. There's guys that can literally be the internet's favorite wrestler tomorrow, but are they going to be respected for what they've done? You know, I, I look at what I've done in 16 years and, you know, I think a lot of people would tell you that, I uh, I like to think I'm respected. Definitely. But, uh, who knows? But the, the other cool thing was when I saw that kind of the, the graphic for the Crockett match. Um, obviously, you spent time in FCW previously. There, I'm not going to dive into that kind of side of the world. But Buddy Stretcher would have obviously spent time with um, Mike McGillicuddy. Uh, Bill Callis obviously faced e Ethan Carter the third in TNA. So that's kind of it was a kind of a cool full circle moment. You talk about like going cool. around so. What's funny about that is EC3 actually worked for my dad's independent promotions when I was about 13 years old. So I've known him way longer than that. You know, so when I got to FTW, he was kind of one of the, the only familiar faces. But um, I think that's one thing about wrestling is, is the longer you're in it, the more you understand who really has it, wants it, deserves it. Um, you know, I always say that there's, 99% of wrestlers will tell you they love the business. Mm -hmm. And I'd say 97 of them don't love the business. They love the clout. They love the attention. They love the fandom that it's brought them. They love their nostalgia that wrestling has given them. Very few people love the business. And those who love the business, it's almost not even a choice. It, was, it wasn't even their decision that they decided to love it. It's almost like a curse because they're, they're, they're doing it right. And nothing makes sense you know, logically on, on what everybody else is doing. Um, it's you're almost stuck with caring too much. And after so long, you run into these people, you know, you might, mm -hmm. there might be somebody like EC3 that 10 years ago, I didn't see him as one of those guys, but now 10 years later, you're on the road, you know, you've been up and down and we're here, not because we need to be, or because we want to be, it's just because we're here. This is who we are. And I feel like, you know, there, there's only a certain few wrestlers like that out there, especially on the independents. Um, but even, you know, TV wrestlers, when, when the money dries up, very few of them stick around because they're part of the business and they want to be, you know, trainers or, or uh, you know, agents or whatnot. I think at the end of the day, the, the true love is hard to find. And I definitely think, you know, EC3 is one of the guys that, that has it. Yeah, like it was, it, that, that, that full circle moment that like you, you talk about, people talking about loving the business, that it, it feels like low hanging fruit. It feels like a cliche. Everybody kind of has to say these days when they come across in interviews as well. So that, that's really well articulated. Um, well, I, th I think, I think about, you know, one more point on that is, uh, you know, you almost, everybody can tell you they love the business, but it, and you can really, especially someone in my position that's been around for a long time, even before I was wrestling, all I have to do is talk to somebody and I can tell who really loves the business because you cannot, you can't fake your way through knowledge. You know, you cannot BS passion. You can, you know, you can BS knowledge. You can, you know, put, 
point out dates and wrestlers and try to talk and, you know, drop some obscurities to make me think, wow, he actually knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you, you know, you could slip up so easily and, and show your cards. Whereas, you know, passion, you can literally, you can see somebody do one little detail in the ring and just say, huh, nobody's doing that. Nobody's teaching that. Mm. Who's he working with that could, no, this guy, he knows, he studies, you know, and, and that's something that I admire a lot amongst independent wrestlers. No, that's really, really cool. And there was somebody else, like, obviously you're close with that had, um, probably still does have a huge amount of passion as well, was somebody you should team with, obviously your brother, Corey Graves. Um, might we ever see it? You put up a cool video a while ago of YouTube sparring. Might at any point in the future, is there any possibility of Samuel Elias and, say, certain James Keenan ever appearing in a, a WrestleRex tag team match or anything? <laughs> I think more than anything, I would hope that, you know, Sam Graves and Corey Graves get to team together in a, a WWE style match somewhere, you know, maybe the the fabulous Graves brothers against the Paul brothers or something. That'd be great. But uh, no, I, I have no real insight on that. Uh, you know, my brother is happy with what he has, where he is. You know, he just had a baby with Carmella and everything's going great in their lives. Um, things are going great for me in Mexico. Uh, I, I would love it as a, you know, as a, one off or as a just a, a selfishly as a child saying hell yeah i'd love the main event wrestlemania with my brother you know yeah but at the same time i, I think we're both smart enough to not prioritize any of that right now mm. but that's you know again it, it, it all comes down the world the world's a weird place you know and just manifesting it and saying something like that you never know what's going to go viral what's going to happen here there anywhere and and you know awesome. who knows yeah, no, it's cool. You kind of articulated that really nice story there. Like, it, people who follow their passion doesn't always work out. But you have two people who put the head down, follow something you really love, and you've got a really good quality of life and a good self fulfillment, both of you to a degree. So that's, that's really cool to hear. I, I've kept you for long enough now. Um, but I just want to ask you one final question. What, what's on the, the horizon for Sam Adonis? Over the coming months, obviously, you're not sure what's going on with Triple H in, in, with the Triple Mania shows. But what other projects you got in the timeline of Irish fans want, want to reach out and see what you're up to? So, um, more than anything, I would like to make more of a presence here in the United States. Right. Um, AAA has had my priority for the past four years, and it's it's really hard for a lot of people to grasp. But you know, in Mexico, uh, you know, I'm I'm a I'm almost a celebrity. You know, I'm on TV, and then you know, going to shops, and I'm giving. So it's really you know, unless you watch AAA or know of AAA, to a lot of the American fans, I'm just an indie guy. You know, and that's kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes. Um, I'm a busy indie guy. I still travel all over the country and do a lot of independence. And most of them are, you know, Lucha based. Um, I would like to be seen more. Uh, and I don't know where or specifically. Um, hopefully, AAA just started back on American television two weeks ago. Uh, they're now on Unimas, which is a Univision affiliate. But it's Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm hoping maybe somehow that can catch steam again. And, you know, maybe again, all it takes is one writer, you know, making it cool again. If, if, if Dave Meltzer tells everybody to watch AAA on Saturdays, okay. you know, it's a whole different game. So, um, hopefully my, my profile can increase here in the United States. Uh, I do truly believe that my best days are yet to come. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I do want to eventually make the name for myself here in the United States. And, you know, I don't really know what the finish line is yet, but I know that, you know, right now AAA is awesome. I'm very grateful for everything I have done and am doing with them. Um, and I'm going to ride it out, see what happens. And hopefully with a bit of luck, there'll be a inevitable baby face run here within the next six to 12 months, because that's literally the last thing I've never done. And I think I'm going to, Tear the house down when the time's right. Amazing, amazing. Listen, 631 matches. You've been doing this for 16 years. You've traveled all over the world. I think I said to you previously, I'd love to see you in Ireland for OTT as well. Um, listen, I, I think this, the world is your oyster and it, it does feel like there's a momentum following you everywhere you go at the moment. So I'm wishing you all the very best in the world, my friend. I appreciate that. Did you say 631 matches? Yeah, according to Cage Match, yeah. Okay, so I, I again, I don't really want to rock the boat here, but in a way... <laughs> Cage match very, very yeah, yeah. often upsets wrestlers because of things like that. Yeah. <laughs> 631 matches is, you know, probably one eighth of my career, right. you know, and, and to somebody that's ignorant, the cage match has this reputation as being a, a, a you know, a tell all yeah. as where you get your, your baseline information. Um, I mean, there is eight shows a week in Mexico that aren't even reported online. All-star. You know, there's shows. Yeah. 
all star wrestling as well, you know. So it's I guess to somebody maybe 600 sounds like a lot, but you know, to me when you think about it, I, you know, I'm probably somewhere around the 2500 maybe 3000 mark at this point just because I'm I, you know, I, I've been a busier guy than most American independent wrestlers. That's, that's incredible. Even more Sorry, didn't didn't mean to didn't mean oh. to uh, go on a, t- a tirade there about cage match. We no, love you, cage it. match. No, appreciate it because the two of us were chatting before the the, the show talking about your experience with All Star Wrestling. So I, I think you would fit like your glove in OTT. Particularly, there's a lot of our uh, wrestlers in this part of the world who've done the 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 holiday camps. They've done all the experience, the All Star Wrestling and whatnot over there. So anytime you. I'll get on to Joe Cabray, get Adam well, also tweeting him this as well. So it'd be amazing to have you over. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll actually hit up Joe Cabray myself. And maybe if you can get a, a, a crowdfunded uh, a, a petition, get everybody to make some noise on Twitter, maybe I'll be back over there. Absolutely incredible. Listen, Sam, thank you very, very much for your time. I really do appreciate it, my friend. Thanks a lot, buddy. Have a good one. And you.